Good evening, everyone. I'm Jay Perman. Uh, I'm president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and it is indeed an honor uh, to welcome you all this evening. Uh, nothing gives me greater pleasure uh, than being among those who work daily for peace, for justice, for opportunity. Uh, so for me, I'm in the best of company, and uh, I thank all of you uh, for serving as both the hope and the struggle that sustain us. I extend, sir, my deepest gratitude, uh, my deepest gratitude to Lord John Alderdice, uh, who shortly will share his wisdom with us. Uh, wisdom which he's developed, earned over a remarkably accomplished career. Political leader and activist, negotiator, a scientist, and academic. And accompanying our distinguished guests are six faculty and staff members from Coventry University. Uh, of course, we thank all of you for making the trip. Uh, we're very eager to share with you, to learn from you, and continue this budding friendship. Uh, I want to thank Professor Virginia Rothern uh, and everybody at UMB Center for Global Education Initiatives. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Flav Lilly and his colleagues in our graduate school. And I thank Ms. Ashley Vallis, everyone at our UMB Community Engagement Center, uh, who live this mission of engagement every day and who inspire us all. Now, tomorrow, uh, you're going to meet some of our partners in the neighborhoods that we serve, the community residents, the leaders who work with us to create neighborhoods of strength and resilience and hope. We simply could not what, do what we do in the community without their trust, without their candor and honesty, uh, and without their unselfish, generous collaboration. Uh, we're blessed, really, by a city of partners, and uh, we're in their debt. Uh, finally, uh, we wouldn't be gathered here tonight if it weren't for Dr. Roger Ward and Professor Mike Carty. Last year, Dr. Ward, who is UMB's Chief Accountability Officer, was invited to Coventry. He told me he was going for a week, and he comes back with all of this. Uh, he was very impressed, I know, with what he found at Coventry and especially, especially Professor Hardy, with the Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations, which you direct. Uh, these two men knew that they wanted to do something together, uh, that there was an opportunity here to engage one another, to take from our different experiences, our different perspectives, really potentially transformative opportunities. I know these perspectives, where they align and when they diverge, uh, will be instructive for us. Uh, because we sometimes use different words to describe the same goals. Where we in, might, we in Baltimore might talk about civil rights and social justice and community engagement, our colleagues in Coventry might talk of trust, and peace and reconciliation. But vocabulary aside, our similarities are too many to ignore. The town of Coventry, I understand, has pockets of acute poverty. It's a diverse city with dozens of languages spoken there. Coventry is a multi-school university deeply dedicated to working with its neighbors, deeply dedicated to international education, to using global strategies to affect local change, and vice versa. 
we've learned that here as well. Both of our nations face considerable uncertainty in the years ahead. Let's face it, political crises eclipse the real and profound needs of communities that suffer from endemic poverty, isolation, and neglect. So the symposium we begin tonight is meant to help us share community engagement strategies across communities, across professions, between universities and communities, and indeed across borders. Sometimes, and we've learned this, I've certainly learned it personally, you just need to hear a really great idea in a different accent. <laughs> so we're about to embark on a uh, historic occasion. Uh, this is the first rising global peace forum held outside of the city of Coventry. And I thank its pioneers for the tremendous honor of letting us use the Rising name. If you don't know the history of Rising, it's the unique vision of Coventry University, the City Council, and Coventry Cathedral. It began as a platform for bringing people and policymakers together to share their stories and their ideas, and above all, to provoke peace. Peace and reconciliation are truly in Coventry's blood. When the Coventry Cathedral was bombed during World War II, the decision was made the very next day to rebuild, not as an act of defiance, but rather as a sign of faith, trust, and hope in the future. The ruins of the old cathedral stand alongside the new one, built with donations and gifts from around the world. And I wonder what landmarks there are in our city of Baltimore that we can compare to Coventry Cathedral. Certainly they're not as grand, but there are buildings here rebuilt after conflict, communities restored after unrest, neighborhoods reclaimed from neglect, people resilient in the face of systemic inequity. These landmarks, these people, this hope for the future and hope for humanity are what compel our collective presence here tonight, and for that I thank you. It's now my honor to introduce our most distinguished guest. For 30 years, Lord John Alderdice has been a key figure in the Irish peace process. As leader of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland, he was instrumental in every aspect of resolving the historic conflict all the way through to the negotiation of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. Lord Alderdice later became the first speaker of the new Northern Ireland Assembly, leading the establishment of the new legislature. He was later appointed to the Independent Monitoring Commission, tasked by the British and Irish governments with closing down terrorist operations and overseeing normalization of security activity in Northern Ireland. Most recently, Lord Alderdice was invited to develop a new strategy to bring an end to the remaining paramilitary organizations in Northern Ireland. And he established the Center for Democracy and Peacebuilding in Belfast to work on the changes in culture and attitude that will complete the Irish peace process. He's equally committed to liberal politics outside Northern Ireland he served in the leadership of the European Liberal Democrat and Reform Party and as president of Liberal International, a worldwide network of more than 100 liberal political parties. He was named Liberal International's lifetime president of honor, the organization's highest distinction. Lord Alderdice's contributions to liberal politics at home and abroad were recognized 
when he was appointed one of the youngest ever life members of the House of Lords in the British Parliament, where he would serve as chairman of the Liberal Democrat Parliamentary Party. Lord Alderdice's main focus now is as director of the Center for Resolution of Intractable Conflict based at Harris Manchester College at the University of Oxford. There he focuses on understanding and engaging with the problems of religious fundamentalism, political radicalization, and violent community conflict. Lord Alderdice's professional background is as a clinical and academic physician and psychiatrist. And in this regard, he has a serendipitous relationship with our university. To speak on Lord Alderdice's work in psychiatry and his collaboration with UMB, I would like to invite to the podium Professor Ben Coley Johnson, who is the Irving J. Taylor Professor and Chair in the University of Maryland School of Medicine's Department of Psychiatry. Professor Johnson. I'm extremely thrilled to be invited to say a few words about what I know about John Alderdice, and I call him John, so um, you'll have to accept that, I hope. <laughs> and uh, also because at this setting, I think that I'm standing on the podium with two of the great leaders in the world who have been illuminating lights for peace and justice. One of the most important things I want to tell you about John, who I've known for about 15 odd years now, is something that you wouldn't find in his CV. John is a man of incredible courage and conviction. I lived in Britain at the time of the Troubles, and, I could, and you could imagine how difficult it must have been when there was such polarization of language and polarization even within people who were meant to like each other in terms of being able to plot a path forward. John did this with great poise and to the great admiration of the British people. And he's actually, as uh, Dr. Perman said, one of the youngest life peers of the realm. The other thing I want to say about um, John is that he's a clinical psychiatrist who works with us in our department. And he embraced this role with great fervor. John could have easily have told me, Ben Coley, I'm extremely busy. I'm out there saving the world, changing, creating world peace. And what can I do with looking after two residents for four or six weeks a year? But he didn't say that. He said, send them along. One of the things the students tell me when they go is they say, John takes personal care of us. He takes us to the House of Commons. He takes us to the House of Lords. I'm sure he just walks past the House of Commons, by the way. He takes us on the train. He takes us to Ireland. John displays, in my view, the quintessential attributes of an academic and a scholar. One of the attributes, some of the attributes some, that some people have forgotten of being a true professor. I'll also say with regards to being a true professor, some of the writings and teachings that John has put forward is very important, and it's very important for us in Baltimore. Yes, psychiatrists deal with people who have mental illness. Yes, psychiatrists are meant to work with people who have mental illness. But psychiatry is now being transformed into a different type of specialty in which the health and the mental health of the population becomes now important, and we not only are doctors in the community, but we are doctors for the community. As Dr. Perman has said, the language of psychiatry is very important, and the language of peace is very important. Peace and the dialogue that goes with it is intergenerationally poisoned. If you live in an atmosphere where there's poisoning and dad is poisoned, grandpa is poisoned, 
There is nothing that can come up with an interaction to see something positive. But John has always found a way to express that, to open people's eyes. He has been able to bring people along, and he is a true leader and academic. So John, I salute you, and welcome to the University of Maryland. Dr. Perman, Professor Coley Johnson, thank you very much indeed for your kind and generous welcome. It's lovely to be back here uh, in Baltimore, lovely to be back in this wonderful hall and particularly to be back here uh, with Coley Johnston uh, and with my colleague Ava Grossman. Ava is the chief executive of the Centre for Democracy and Peacebuilding that we have in Belfast and it's tremendous to work with her. She's originally from Poland but she's come to give her time and herself to building peace and democracy in Northern Ireland. And of course, both of us are delighted to be here with uh, Mike Hardy and friends and colleagues from Coventry University. We've worked together in Belfast, in Baku, in Bogota, and now in Baltimore. Uh, and of course, also in Oxford and in Coventry, where our two universities are based. Uh, to be back here in Baltimore is a, an enormous pleasure and, and privilege. The first time I came here was actually in 1991 when Kurt Schmuck was the mayor. And you may say, why did, we, did I come then? Well, uh, I was on Belfast City Council. And uh, we were still in the midst of difficulties. But there was a determination that we were going to turn that city around. And when we looked around to try to find cities in the world that had turned themselves around, that had gone from being uh, a bit of a tragedy uh, to being a great success in many ways. Baltimore was one of the places that came to our mind because you did some tremendous developments down at the waterfront. And Belfast had turned its back on the Lagan River, which was our waterfront. Uh, and we thought, Baltimore's the place to go. In fact, we not only came here, but we employed the consultants that you had used to de develop the waterfront, and we brought them to Belfast and it made a tremendous difference. In fact, there was one particular incident that I remember associated with that, which gave one of the very first signs that the IRA might be moving to a ceasefire. As I say, I was on Belfast City Council, and we were discussing the prospect of spending what in those days seemed like a lot of money, it was over 30 million pounds, to build a concert hall and conference center. And the debate was continuing on, and uh, the leader of Sinn Féin, who was also a significant leader in the IRA, stood up and said, well, we have decided in Sinn Féin we are going to support this. It's a lot of money, and our people are very concerned about a lot of money, but we, we know it's going to be built close to a part of the city where we have a lot of people who are unemployed, and we think that they will get jobs, and so we're prepared to support it. One of the loyalist politicians on the other side, Sammy Wilson, who later went on to be the Minister of Finance, stood up and said, oh, you're going to support it. Does that mean you're not going to blow it up then? <laughs> to which Alex Maskey, the Sinn Féin leader, said, <laughs> and that was our first indication that the IRA might be considering a different approach to things, which of course they did, and, and, and that's an important story. Now, you might well say, well, it's very interesting, uh, but what relevance has that got, really, to the kinds of problems that we have in Baltimore? And that's a very reasonable question. And I'm certainly not going to be telling you what you should be doing in Baltimore. I, I'm very fond of the city. I now try to get here at least a couple of times a year, and, and as Coley is saying, we have young trainees from the University of Maryland in Baltimore who come over to spend time with me in Oxford and in Belfast and, 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 and in Dublin. Um, but I'm not going to come and tell you because that's not how these things work. I remember many years ago, at an early stage in the process, Nelson Mandela took an interest in our troubles. And he invited lots of us to go out to South Africa. And in those days, the Protestant Unionists, particularly Dr. Paisley's party, wouldn't even travel in the same plane as Sinn Féin. 
they certainly wouldn't be in the same room as Sinn Féin. And so Nelson Mandela had to come and give his speech to us twice, once with the Democratic Unionist Party and once with all the rest of us. And he started off saying, you know, we realize it's, it's a very difficult problem and it's not the same as our problem and we're not here to tell you how to solve your problem, we're just here to tell you our story. And, and, and actually we will do anything we can to help. Look, we've even reintroduced apartheid for the weekend just to make it possible for you to be here. <laughs> that kind of humor from such an extraordinary person got through to us in a way that no amount of instruction would have. But of course, what he said to us was right. By telling us his story and the story of his colleagues in South Africa, we could pick up those things which were relevant to us. Of course, you will know that our color problem was orange and green, not black and white. But what you may not know is how other historic aspects of our difficulties were maybe not as far away as you might think. In the 19th century, if you had come to boarding houses in London, you would have found them with signs out saying, no blacks or Irish. Your first president, George Washington, only once left North America, and that was to go to Barbados. And it wasn't for a holiday. It wasn't that kind of place in those days. But what it did have was good weather, and his brother had tuberculosis. And he brought his brother to Barbados, the two great ports on this side of the Atlantic were Barbados and Boston. And he brought him to Barbados. Uh, and of course, if you go now, 95% of the population are Afro-Caribbean because they were brought there as slaves. They weren't the first slaves. The first slaves, it was called indentured labor rather than slavery, but it was the same thing, were Scotch and Irish. And the reason they moved to bring African slaves is because the Scotch and Irish died in the sun. They couldn't cope with it. But they were actually the first slaves. So the kinds of struggle and difficulty and history that we're dealing with are not fundamentally matters of color just on its own. They're often matters of culture. And they're matters of human relationships, not just of individuals, but of large groups. And that's why I think it's worthwhile to tell each other our stories, not because they're identical, they're not, not because it brings all the answers, because it doesn't. But because as human beings, there are certain common things about the human condition that we share. And that's why I spend this time with you, and I, and I hope it's a worthwhile thing. When we are dealing with these kinds of problems, we're not dealing with something new. Divided societies and violence go back a very, very long way indeed. I've got a picture up here of the god Janus. Now, the story of the god Janus is this. When Romulus and Remus established Rome, they were, they were basically a, a crowd of gangsters. You know, they, they robbed people and they brought it to this place with the seven hills around it. And, and that was quite satisfactory for a while. And then they began to realize, you know, there's no women about. Not many women joined the band. Well, this wasn't going to be very good. It, it, they weren't going to be able to survive. It wasn't going to be very much fun to survive. So what were they going to do? Well, they decided that there was a group of people not very far away called the Sabines. And they had a village. And they had women. And when they saw these Sabines with their women, they thought, we want those. So they invited them all to a big party one night. This is not a recommendation, by the way. They invited them all to a big party one night, and when they got them a feed of drink, they started to kill the men, chased them all off, and held onto the women for themselves. And it was a very problematic business altogether, as you can imagine. And when it came to the death of Romulus, and they were looking for a second king, they thought, we really have to focus on dealing with this divided society. So the second king was Numa Pompilius, and he was a Sabine. But just because they had a Sabine for their king didn't mean that it solved all the problems, not at all. And what he did, he was a very shrewd man. 
and he created a structure of law and culture and religion that helped to bind the people together. And one of the gods that he taught them to worship was the god Janus. Two heads, one looking to the Romans and one to the Sabbaths. One looking to the past and one to the future. That's why we celebrate January as we come out of the old year and into the new year. The god Janus, his head was put on a, on a doorway in the temple of Janus and it was opened during times of war and closed during times of peace because there was no need for the soldiers to come in and out. He taught them to worship the god Terminus, the god of boundaries. They would celebrate the boundaries that kept people safe. And I'm going to come back to that. But the point that I want to make really is that it's a very long time since people have been dealing with divided societies and often turning to things like law and culture and religion to find ways of resolving the problems. Our problems in Ireland don't go back six centuries BC, but they probably do go back six centuries AD. The biggest battle that was ever fought on the island of Ireland was fought long before England was England. And it was the men of the north of the island fighting with the men of the rest of the island and bringing in their friends from Scotland to help them. If anybody ever tells you that the Irish needed the English to teach them how to fight, it's completely wrong. We knew how to do that long before England was around. But of course, once England became involved, it complicated the whole business. And for generations and for hundreds of years, we've had war and fighting and difficulty and spilt blood as well as bad blood. And we've tried everything for generations and it didn't work. Or at best it worked for a very short time. And when I got involved in politics myself, I got involved because it seemed to me there had got to be a better way of us living together. There had to be some way that we could at least disagree without killing each other. That we should all agree, well, that was unlikely and unreasonable and probably not even healthy. But that we could disagree without killing each other, that's a different matter. Now, when I came into politics, the general view, which I shared, was that the people who were involved with violence, the people on the extremes, we were never going to be able to engage with them. But we could try to get the more moderate people right across the center together. It seemed very reasonable. The only problem was it didn't work. Because every time you got the people from the broad center together, from both sides, Protestant, Catholic, Unionist, and Nationalist, somebody could always do something. They could explode a bomb, they could shoot somebody, they could cause some kind of trouble that would pull the whole thing apart. And eventually, we came to the conclusion with enormous difficulty that we were gonna to have to address the people who were involved with the violence. It seems really obvious now that you can have a political process without the people involved with violence, but you can't have a peace process if you don't engage with the people who are causing the trouble. Now, how you do it, that's another matter. But that it's necessary now seems so self-evident to us, but it was not at all evident at the time. We all thought it was completely impossible and unreasonable. But before we began to engage properly, we also realized we had to understand in a different way. And one of the things that began to become clear to us was that we were dealing fundamentally not with rules and regulations and constitutions and institutions and, and problems with policing and social administration of justice, economic problems. All of these were problems. But in a way, you could subsume all of them and go more deeply by appreciating that these were problems of historic disturbed relationships between communities of people. They were not just about individuals. Often people would say, oh, but I have lots of friends who are Catholics, or I have lots of friends who are Protestants. That's irrelevant. It's not about you as an individual. 
It's about a whole community of people who have particular perspectives. We would, for example, try, as we did for many years, to help young people to move away from this by bringing young people young Protestants and Catholics together to the United States to spend a few weeks here. They would get on perfectly well together and they go back home and it would all be pulled apart again. Why? Because it was a community problem. So we began to look at what kind of relationships we needed to deal with. And we identified three. Between Protestants and Catholics in the North, of course. That was obvious but also between North and South, and between Britain and Ireland. Here were three sets of historic disturbed relationships. Now at that time, Europe was no longer so disturbed. Europe was the container that helped to keep Britain and Ireland together so that people could engage with each other. It gave us a model for, for seeing things in a different way, different at the moment. We now have a fourth disturbed relationship, the relationship between Britain and Europe. But in those days, it was not. It was a container. And as we began to analyze things in a different way, we were able to construct a process on a different model. If we were having three sets of disturbed relationships, then we would bring together the people who represented those relationships. If we were talking north-south, of course we would have the politicians from the north and the Irish government and indeed the British government. But if we were only talking about things in the north, we would not have the Irish government, we would just have the northern parties. And if we were just talking about things between London and Dublin, we would just have the British government and the Irish government, and we wouldn't have the parties in the north. Form followed function. We would have the people there who represented the disturbed relationship. And as time went on and we worked in negotiation, we were able to achieve a new societal accord that represented these disturbed relationships and how we could resolve them. The agreement, the Belfast Agreement, was reached in 1998. It was not at all easy to reach that agreement. But the United States played a very important role. George Mitchell former Senate Majority Leader, made more than 100 return flights to Belfast. He spent time with us. He listened with the most extraordinary patience. I think we should make him an honorary psychiatrist, Colin. <laughs> he would listen hour after hour, day after day, week after week, to politicians explaining what they thought was the roots of the problem what they thought was the reason for the disturbed relationship, and eventually how we might find a way over those things. And there were many dis difficulties, and there were many discouragements. But I want to say this, it's absolutely crucial to us that we reach that societal agreement. Not that everybody signed up for it, but that the leaders of the largest parties did and worked together across the divisions. And here's one of the connections with the challenge you have here in this city. In one of my visits here, both to New York and to Baltimore, and talking to people involved in policing and relationships with the African-American community, I had a senior police officer describe a wonderful program that he felt should be applied. It was an excellent set of ideas. There's no doubt about that. He obviously had a sense of what needed to be done. So you may be surprised that I said to him, that's not going to work. He said, what do you mean? What's wrong with it? I said, there's nothing wrong with the content. The problem is that you're going to tell people this is what you're going to do to them. And what is absolutely crucial is that you negotiate that together so that you share this accord, so that any kind of implementation of this is something you shoulder together, not something that is being imposed on anyone. It's not that it's necessarily incredibly difficult to work out what you need to do. As those of you who are psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists here know, in many cases within a very short time of meeting the patient, you have a pretty good idea what the problem is. But you don't turn around and say, listen, you should go and read chapter four of the book. It absolutely has your problem to a T. Of course not. That's not the problem. <laughs> 
The problem is how do you bring the person to the point where they take that into themselves and are able to make changes and differences? And that's the point. It's only when you work together on these things that you get the outcome that was absolutely necessary for us. And then you have to implement the agreement. We thought it will be so historic. There will be such momentum. It just will carry itself through. It didn't. We needed to have friends and colleagues from outside the country who had no ax to grind to come on a regular basis and say to us, you remember those 153 things that you said you were going to do? You've done very well. You've done 53 of them. But there's still another 100 that you need to work on. And I'll be back in six months to help you with that other 100. We needed our friends and colleagues from outside. And the agreement, the agreement itself, was, was able to be read by every single family in the community. Eva and I have been doing some work in Colombia over the last uh, couple of years because, as you know, there's a peace process ongoing there. One of the problems they have is that when they negotiated their agreement, it's a huge, big, thick thing. Only the people who were involved in making it could possibly ever have read it. That means that the ordinary person doesn't feel any ownership or understanding, and when someone says to them, there's something in there that's bad for you, they assume that that's the case. The agreement was produced just as you see in the illustration. A free copy of it was sent to every single household in Northern Ireland. It was slim enough that everybody could read it. If somebody said to you, there's this in the agreement that's not in your interest, you could check it and see, actually, that's not what it says. And we could continue to work together to try to implement that agreement with the help of outsiders. You know, these are all relatively simple things about human beings and how they work. But it's astonishing how often they're ignored. So, in trying to make sense of this, in trying to implement it, what sorts of things became apparent to us? The first thing that became apparent was that if you tried to deal with the violence as a moral issue of good and evil, you were going to get nowhere. Why? Because my violence is always justifiable violence, and your violence is bad violence. People say that. But, but if it's the matter of the rule of law, ah, yes. But if it's your law, not my law, then it's not experienced as moral at all. I was doing some work a little while ago with Australian Aboriginal people, and they actually talk about blackfella law and whitefella law. Your law may be sitting in the rule book. You may think it's justice, but for me, it's not actually justice at all. It's just your rules in your interest from your culture. And indeed, when you start to deal with people involved in international terrorism, as well as domestic terrorism, and you talk to them, they're perfectly aware that they're breaking the law of the land. But they will say to you, I'm doing it in the service of a higher law. The protection of my people, my culture, their interests. And there are differences. You see, if you're doing ordinary crime, you don't go around telling people that you've done the crime. You want to make sure you get some personal benefit out of it. And it's a total disaster if you get caught and in prison. But if you're doing terrorism, you tell people you've done it. You put out a press release and say, it was us. The tragedy is not your death or even the death of your family. It's the death of the cause. And you're not doing it for your own personal benefit. Nobody ever gets involved in a terrorist campaign for their own personal financial material benefit. I remember after the peace process, an old IRA man coming to me and saying, I wonder, can you help me get a job, John? And I said, yeah, sure, well, what's the problem? He says, John, the IRA had no pension fund. <laughs> People don't join terrorist campaigns for their personal, family, 
or material benefit. So it's not the same kind of breaking the law. So we, we, we began to, to understand that in a divided society, there was no point in talking about good and evil as the issue. But it's not just in that situation. There was a man called James Gilligan. He's still alive. He's very elderly now. But he wrote a number of books, one of them called Violence, Our Deadliest Epidemic, from the United States, a psychiatrist on the eastern seaboard of this country. And he began to realize that there was an extraordinary rate of homicide and suicide in prisons for the criminally insane in this country. And when he began to work with the prisoners there, he began to discover many of them had little ability to read and write. Most of them who had done horrible things didn't feel that they were bad for doing horrible things. They felt that they were reacting against horrible things that had happened to them. And when he started working with them and helping them to read and to write and to engage with things, not only did they begin to discover that actually what they had done was unwise and unhelpful and not good, the suicide and homicide rates absolutely plummeted in the prisons. And then there's a gubernatorial election and somebody got elected on the basis that this is outrageous. These holiday camps for people that should be getting harsh punishment. And the individual was elected and he swept away all the reforms and the suicide and homicide rates soared again. So trying to think of violence and trouble not as a moral problem but as a question of public health takes you to a different way of addressing the problem. Another thing that began to become apparent to us, as I said earlier, was that these problems are not fundamentally problems of individuals. They're problems of large groups. Now, what's large group psychology? Some of you have, may have heard of a, a football team called Manchester United. I see Mike's all ready to cheer already. But you know, all over the world, including in Coventry, on a Sunday morning, there are men in particular who waken up depressed because Manchester United has lost the match on the Saturday. They are part of a large group of millions of people who will never meet each other. Most of them will never even get to Manchester. But they feel a sense of identification with each other. Much more seriously, there are people in the Muslim community all the way from Indonesia to Morocco and beyond who, when something unpleasant happens to a young Muslim Palestinian, feel a great sense of anger about that, even though they hardly know where Palestine is, but they have a sense that somebody in my community has been harmed or damaged. And all of us are members of communities and large groups where we are affected when somebody we identify with is harmed or damaged in some way. And my colleague Vanek Vulcan, who actually comes from northern Cyprus, another divided island that has experienced its, its trials, has identified this in a number of books. I've also mentioned the work of a colleague called Porek O'Malley, and with a name like that, as you can imagine, he's got Irish antecedents. And one of the things that Porek did was he began to study people in a number of places where there was trouble, including the families of all those who died in the IRA hunger strike. And what he discovered was that people get into a place when their community is under existential threat, where their own life is no longer the most important thing, where they believe that to die for the sake of their family is one thing, but to die for the sake of the cause is a wholly other thing. They, they, they die and become part of the pantheon of martyrs. And of course, that's not just an Irish issue. That's in lots of places. And it's not a belief that you die and get a whole bunch of virgins and all of this kind of stuff. That's not what it's about. It's much more transcendent than that. There are three other colleagues that I'd, I'd, I'd refer to who have also helped in their research to develop our understanding of these problems. One is a chap called Scott Atram. And, and what Scott in his research has shown is that when we are in a normal, peaceful, stable society, we generally act largely as rational actors, operating on what's in our best socioeconomic economic 
and power interests. But when we are under existential threat, we begin to think as individuals and communities in a completely different way. We operate under what he calls sacred values. This is not religious values. The life of my child is a sacred value. The welfare of my wife is a sacred value. The good of my country is a sacred value. They're not things you can buy. If you come to me and you say, John, I'll give you $10,000 for your car. My car isn't like Cody's cars. They're worth much more than that. I will say to him, no, no, that's not enough. He says, okay, I'll give you 30,000. I say, right, there we go. If the person comes to me and says, I'll give you 10,000 pounds for your wife. And I say, what are you talking about? He says, you're absolutely right. She's worth 50,000. I'll hit him. <laughs> Because I'll say, what kind of a guy do you think I am? These are not, these are sacred values. These are not instrumental values. They're not able to be purchased. And when I am faced with decisions about those, I am not a rational actor, I'm a devoted actor. I'm committed. And this is the case for people when in their communities they feel under threat. They become devoted actors, operating on these transcendent values. And if you offer them something of a socioeconomic kind, not only does it not work, it actually creates the opposite effect from the one you want. It's not, and, and, I mean, politically, this is, this is important. When my colleagues did some work in, in, in the occupied territories in, in, in Israel, Palestine, and demonstrated that the more money you offered Palestinians to give up the right to return, the more angry they got. And they took this research to the White House. The White House, with the previous administration, said, that can't be right. It can't be that the more money you offer, the worse is the reaction. Said, That's why you're in difficulties. You don't get it. But if somebody was to say to you, as president, I'll give you this much for the stars and stripes, and you say, no, don't be silly, and I say, I'll give you 10 times that amount for the stars and stripes, would you agree? Of course not. So why do you expect that somebody else would for things that are incredibly important to them and their community? And when we get into these situations, our individual values get fused with the values of the group. If you take a bunch of eight or 10 young Marines, and you put them in a dangerous situation together. They bond together like glue. And what's important for all of them is what's important for all of them as a group. They become fused together in their values and their way of being in the world. And my colleague Harvey Whitehouse, also from Oxford, has demonstrated this not just with people in the military, but young people in football teams and in all sorts of circumstances. The final thing I want to mention in, in regard to research comes from a completely different place, but is of enormous importance. In the 1970s, a number of physicists from Los Alamos, where the Manhattan Project, where the bomb came from, began to realize there was a problem about the whole way that we think about science. For the last few hundred years, the way we have worked is to break things down into their elemental particles and understand that if we could appreciate all the, the qualities of these fundamental particles, we would understand a great deal more about what came from them. And there's a lot of truth in it. And it has created enormous scientific and medical and technological progress. But it's only part of the story. You can understand all you like about hydrogen and all you can about oxygen, and it will not tell you about the properties of water. You can understand everything it's possible to know about an ant, what size it is, what shape it is, how it's made up, and it will not tell you what happens when you've got seven million ants in a swarm. You can understand all the interests and properties of every single person in this room. But if we start to act not just as individuals, but as a group of people, a whole new set of qualities begins to emerge. The physicists began to understand this, and they call these emergent properties, properties that emerge from complex adaptive systems. 
Well, that's exactly what we find when we look at people and at communities and at groups. And the implication of it is hugely important. The whole way that our law op operates is to identify the individual who committed a crime, we take them to court, and we put them away. And for ordinary crime, well, it often has some degree of success. But once you get gangs, and once you get terrorist organizations that function as groups and communities, when you take one of them out, you don't solve the problem necessarily at all. You can even make it worse. I was talking to an elderly bishop in this city a number of months ago about the drugs problems here. And he said, and you'll remember this quote, he said, it wasn't always like this, you know. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's been made far worse by what's been done. I said, what do you mean? He said, 20 or 30 years ago, when there were senior guys running the gangs here, they had some little semblance of morality. There's stuff that they would do with women, but there was stuff they wouldn't do. There was stuff that they wouldn't do with kids in terms of drugs and other things. And when the war on drugs came in and it took out all these kingpins, it didn't resolve the drug problem. It simply meant that like hitting a drop of mercury, it spread it all over the place. And there were lots of little gangsters that then emerged who had no sense of rules of those kinds at all. And what was deemed to be a clever and courageous intervention was one that made things worse rather than better. It's one of the things we say to young doctors when we're training them. First, do no harm. If you do good, it's a bonus. But first, do no harm. Sometimes it's quite difficult to do no harm. If you're too courageous, if you're too adventurous, if you do things that really don't have a good evidence base. So we have to be careful about how we handle these things. And if we are dealing with these problems as individual problems of individual people, and actually that's not the phenomenon that we're dealing with, we can make the situation worse rather than better. So it's really important that we try to understand these things. I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but it's, it's about a man called René Girard, who was originally a literary critic, and he then became an anthropologist. And one of the things that he showed in all his work was what imitative creatures we are. I have two boys. They're grown up, they're married, they have kids of their own now. But when they were little, they used to compete for toys. Not a big surprising thing. But one of them was really rather, sh rather shrewd. So when he was playing with the Lego bricks and his brother came over and said, I want those, he didn't fight with him. He just turned away and played with the car. And in no time at all, his brother wanted the car. It doesn't just happen at that level. In the United Kingdom, hardly anybody knew where the Falkland Islands were, down in the South Atlantic until the Argentinians decided that they wanted them. And then we could spend blood and money galore to take a piece of territory that most of us never knew existed. So these are not just things for kids or families. They're things for global politics as well. And one of the striking things which Girard demonstrated is that we put in place boundaries to help block the violence taking over. And what are the boundaries? Things like law, culture, and religion. Remember Numa Pompilius? Thousands of years ago? And it's still the same things. They're still the same issues that we need to find ways of putting in place by agreement and acceptance. So, if there are these understandings, can we summarize them in a way that is not specific to our situation, but useful in others? Well, here's some of the things. First of all, external players are key to creating a new context. We would never have resolved our problems if it had just been Protestants and Catholics, Unionists and Nationalists trying to address them together. We needed people from outside who were significant stakeholders 
to help us do that. But we also needed them because they played a role. The historic difficult relationship between Britain and Ireland was a contributor to our problem. It wasn't something completely separate away over there. And what happens in this city is not isolated off from what happens in the state of Maryland or in the United States of America or even more broadly than that. If there are issues of drugs, they don't all come out of Baltimore, even if they come into Baltimore. They come from all sorts of places. And how we deal with our wider community and stakeholders is really important in this. We had to find a way of bringing the violence to an end, but that was not a solution of itself. The violence, the harm, was a symptom of the disturbed historic relationships. And if we stopped the violence and didn't deal with the relationships, sure as eggs are eggs, the violence would come back again. And the agreement and its implementation required these external friends who would work with us. The whole process was not about good guys and bad guys. All of us are bad guys and good guys. And understanding that became critical to dealing with our problems. Not just as individuals, but as whole communities. We needed to find new ways of relating with each other. When I became speaker of the assembly, there was no point in saying, well, we'll run it like Westminster. Oh, the unionists would have said that's marvelous. But what about the nationalists? Or if I'd said, we'll run it like Dublin, we'd have had the same problem. In fact, we had this problem. Because when we started to talk about what, what arrangement we would have with seating, some of them said, let's have it like Westminster. Others said, let's have it like the US Congress. Others said, let's ha like, have it like the EU. We had to find a way of negotiating everything, the color of the carpet, the shape of the desks, whether we had benches or chairs. What about headed writing paper? All of these kinds of things we had to negotiate. And in the doing of that, <coughs> build new relationships. These relationships need constant nourishment. We know this as individuals. If you think you've got your relationships sorted out, they're already in trouble. These eight renegades here are the Northern Ireland politicians who negotiated the Belfast Agreement. All of us are looking a bit older nowadays. And there were two others who left the talks because as soon as Sinn Féin came in, they weren't prepared to stay at the table. And they spent many years trying to destroy the process. But eventually the process was bigger than the naysayers, and they came in and became a part of it. So what did we learn? Political leadership is crucial. I don't think that's just true of our situation. I think if you don't have people who've got the determination and the courage and the commitment to go out there as leaders and bring people with them, because you're not a leader if you've got no followers, but without leaders and leadership, it's very hard to get very far. Negotiation is not something you do for a week or two to get an agreement. Negotiation had to become for us a way of life. Week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, negotiating everything you can imagine and a bunch of stuff you can't imagine had to be negotiated. Sometimes people say to me, but John, you can't do that when there's no trust. Trust is an outcome of the process of negotiation, not a prerequisite for it. If you're dealing with people who have tried to kill you, you'd be daft to trust them. So you start off trying to find out, if I negotiate with the meeting at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, will they turn up round about 9 o'clock or tell me if they're not going to come? And you find the answer is yes, and you say, okay, I can trust them to turn up at 9 o'clock in the morning.
And you build on that and you build on that and then there will be reversals when you find you're disappointed in something and then you build further. Trust is an outcome of a process of working with people whom you started off not being able to trust. It's not a prerequisite for a process of this kind. We find that international monitoring was absolutely essential, as I've said. And I've said here that civic society has to be prepared to change. Sometimes people say the powerful are the ones who have to change. The people in authority who make decisions have to change. If you're going to wait for that, you wait a long time. Because the people who are in authority are there because, because they're there. That's how they got there. Why should they want to change in such a way that they would lose it? It's like trying to make constitutional change. The people who have been voted in under a certain constitution don't want to change that constitution. It's only in a constitutional crisis that you can make changes of that kind. What that means is it's the victims, it's the people on the lower side that actually have to start making the change. It was Sinn Féin, not the British government, who began to work on a peace process because they began to realize that the physical force approach was not going to bring them the, what they wanted, that the people who suffered most from the use of violence were the people they represented, and they began to realize that there was a stalemate. They couldn't be defeated, but they could never win. So they had to find a, bit, a different way. And I find very often in crises and conflicts that the people on the wrong side, the people who are on the weaker side, say it's for the more powerful people to make the, the difference. But they can't and they won't. And therefore, it's important to help those who are weaker to begin to change the frame. And that means changes in civil society as well. We're part of a university. The reassuring thing about all of this is that understanding does actually help as long as it's connected with the real world. As long as the research we're doing is following the evidence where it takes us, even if that's not where we want to go. But if we do that, if we have the courage to do that and the determination and the stamina, then we in universities have a real contribution to make, to change for the better in our society. And that is surely fundamentally what we're about. And finally, to just emphasize again that relationships involve complexity. And finally, there is no finally. I don't mean I'm going to continue to speak. I mean that there is no end to a process like this. As long as there is life in a community, there are challenges, there are difficulties. That's the way we are as human beings. I said at the very beginning that the aim was not to reach agreements, but to find ways that we could disagree without killing each other. It's a dynamic process, it's a challenging process, but I have to tell you, and you won't be surprised, it's an enormously satisfying process when you can drive through a city at a, at a time now when people can go out and enjoy themselves, when kids can go out for the evening and their parents aren't fearful if they're a few minutes late home that something horrible has happened to them, when people have a choice of restaurants because they're not being blown up, where people are able to meet across the boundaries and establish relationships. There's an enormous sense of satisfaction when you grew up in a city that was the opposite of all of that and your children and grandchildren can inhabit a different place. And when Ian Paisley and Gerry Adams were separately asked by the journalists, why did you do it? Both of them gave the same answer. I did it for the grandchildren. We're all human beings and our relationships are the most important thing in life for us.
as individuals, in families, and in whole communities. And I wish you well and want you to know that your colleagues and friends in Belfast are here for you when it can be of help. Thank you. Well, it's hard to begin. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Are there questions or comments for Lord Alderdice? If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, please come to the mic, tell us who you are, if you don't mind. And uh, I'm being presumptuous, but I think Lord Alderdice would be happy to address you. Please. Thanks. Um, I'm Megan Meyer, I'm in the School of Social Work here on campus, and I just want to say that was awesome, because I really think it adds a lot to have a completely different perspective come and share incredibly valuable insight into something that we wouldn't necessarily see in our own city. So I think by comparing it with Northern Ireland, I'm just like, that's brilliant. Um, because I think we can begin to get outside ourselves a bit um, and see what that process, could, what we can learn from that process. And so I guess my question um, is you talk about the critical nature of um, in a sense, uh, outsiders coming in to help mediate, uh, hold parties accountable. How does that look? What, does that, what would that look like if we were talking about um, working across either race lines in this city or just across university community boundaries? Who are those, in a sense, outside mediators or accountability holders? What, would that, what does that look like? In this last slide, beyond. What we've decided to do is because next year we're coming up to the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And the Centre for Democracy and Peacebuilding, which Ava runs, Queen's University in Belfast, the Ulster University and the British Council are coming together to run an event, not just looking at what has happened in the last 20 years, or what might happen, but also to bring colleagues from Colombia, from Lebanon, from South Africa, and from the Western Balkans to look at the challenges of applying these principles in all these different circumstances. And I guess the thought that comes to my mind is, maybe it would be of value to arrange for some friends from Baltimore to come to Belfast to meet with people there, to explore the ups and downs and difficulties, and to try to find ways in which you can make the decisions about what applications you take out of those circumstances. Uh, and I have no doubt that people in Belfast would, would welcome the opportunity to share that with you. Uh, so that's one possible way of doing it. Uh, what I'm sure about is that it's not for people like me to tell you what to do. But if it is useful to sit down with people here in the city and help people to talk about these things, well, that's another matter, of course. That is, that is something we spend our lives doing, so we're happy to do it and happy to explore. Uh, John, that was amazing. So I have a comment and uh, a question. Um, I too had the privilege of, actually I went with President Clinton to meet Nelson Mandela just at the turn of apartheid, and I got a chance to ask my one question uh, of, from the great man. He said, 
the one piece of wisdom he would always give to anybody in conflict is never be angry at the people. You can be as angry as you like about the situation, but never be angry at the people because when you're angry with the person, you lose all perspective. At the current time, as you know, we live in a world in which there is a feeling amongst most people that there's a climate of polarization. And so what can we do as academic leaders, as citizens, and as people to change the language and to change the rhetoric such that we could be healers in what we say and we can educate and be wise? Thanks very much indeed, Kuli. You're absolutely right about both of those things. First of all, that when there are powerful negative feelings, we have to think about what we do about them. And secondly, that our language is really, really important. First of all, about the feeling of anger. One of the things that I learned as a very young psychotherapist, dealing with some quite difficult people, was that when I started to feel really angry with one of the patients, in a way that didn't immediately make sense to me, it was worth thinking about what they were angry about. In other words, that they were making me feel how they felt. And if I try to think about some of the political dynamics in this country at the moment, and how angry many of my friends feel about some of the things that are being said and done, I think it's worth reflecting on whether the current occupation of the White House comes out of some other people being very, very angry about some things. And using our capacity to think to explore what they may be very angry about. And not to put words about reasonableness and logicality and rationality and all of those kinds of things, because we don't fall in love for good reasons and we don't get angry for good reasons. We just, we get angry. And, and, and so trying to think, I'm very angry about what's happening politically. Is that telling me about how angry some other people have been that they put this into me? The second thing is about language, and you're really absolutely right about that. We actually had to construct a new language for the peace process. So that, for example, when somebody would be asked, what are you trying to achieve? The answer that John Hume gave was, we are trying to achieve an outcome that everybody can live with. And people would push him and they'd say, well, what kind of, is it a united Ireland you want? And he would say, we want a shared Ireland, and we want to agree about how we share it. And people would often get frustrated because they say, but, but is it yes or no? You know, particularly journalists, you know, you agree this or that. And he would absolutely refuse. And a whole new language began to develop out of that. And then that began to infect other people as well. So that, for example, when David Trimble, the unionist leader who came from a really quite right-wing background, when he was challenged, and when he stood up to speak to his own people, he said to them, just because people have a past that we don't like doesn't mean they can't have a different future. And, and, and it, it injected a new way of thinking into his own people. So when you are trying to deal with a situation like this, you actually have to invent a new way of speaking about things in order to get through to people a new way of being in the community. So thank you very much indeed for both of those uh, comments. They're absolutely on the mark. Hi, um, my name is Nicole Campion Diallo. I'm a third year medical student here and interested in psychiatry. Um, so when I look at Baltimore, my neighborhood, and I think about the sort of intergenerational trauma that many people experience, um, it's really overwhelming to think how any kind of high up systems based um, solution or change could address the very individual real experiences that people have had. So I'm wondering what was your experience from a mental health perspective in Belfast 
um, after the agreement, how did, how did the individual mental health sort of play out from there? Well, that's really a basis for a PhD. <laughs> it's a really good question, and it's a very complex one. The first thing is the recognition of the intergenerational component. I remember quite a number of years ago saying, and it was treated with some surprise, that we were now beginning to see young people coming forward with symptoms which I believed were related not to what they had experienced, but to what their parents had experienced. And the difficulty about it was they didn't make any connection with what had happened because they hadn't experienced it. And the therapists, who there were themselves relatively young people, who had become professionals after the troubles were over, also didn't make any kind of connection with it. Indeed, there was a piece of work done some years ago by some Australian family therapists who were treating a number of Jewish kids in Australia who were getting into all sorts of trouble. And they couldn't understand that nothing was working. And they started to bring the families together. And they discovered that in every one of the cases, there was a grandparent who had been involved in the Holocaust and had never talked about it. And when they got them to start talking about it, it began to become possible to deal with the children, to deal with the young people. So I think the first thing that is really important is recognizing what you have said, that there is this transgenerational component and that therefore you cannot expect to deal with the problem if you don't at least understand and acknowledge what has happened previously and beyond the experience. The second thing is, that we made, in my view, a really serious error in our approach. Because people didn't understand this difference between individual pathology and large group pathology, they felt that it wasn't possible to deal with the problems that individuals had from their bad experience, their traumatic experience, until we had a political resolution. Of course, that was nonsense. There was absolutely no reason for not dealing with the problems of individuals. And so the government didn't put any extra money into therapy or counseling or any of these kinds of things during the period of the Troubles. And it could have been done, and it wasn't. And I think one of the positive things that come out of the, the Colombian experience is that one of the first things they did was pass a victim's law. Now, you can, you can poke holes in the precise details of the law and all of that kind of business, but the principle was a very good one. They learned from our experience that you should not leave it to the end of the road to deal with the victims. You should acknowledge that at the start and then try to see what you can do as time goes on. And of course, there are communal issues about how a whole community of people deals with the trauma of the past. And, and that's something I think not just psychiatrists, but sociologists and anthropologists and lawyers and and, and indeed architects and artists and musicians have a role to play in in terms of how a whole community develops ways of dealing with its past. So as I say, there's, you're opening up a, a box here with loads of things in it. And what's important is that each of us tries to understand and play the role that we can play. And there may be some things that are specific to us as psychiatrists and social workers and therapists, and there may be things which we have to work with others outside of our profession if we're going to be able to deal with helpfully and successfully. Thanks. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Matt Haas, and uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to hear Lord Alderdice in England a few weeks ago. My professor, Georgia Sorensen, is up front, so hi, Georgia. Um, I'm a, a, a native Baltimorean. And um, I am um, very curious, because listening to your talk, how important politicians play into change. Um, in Baltimore, um, we have a significant problem with drugs and crime. And um, you had mentioned Kurt Schmoke, who uh, was a, a leader and still is a leader in, in Baltimore, um, and was bold enough many years ago, and people thought, you know, he, he was outlandish, he was crazy, that we should consider legalizing drugs. What does it take to make real just change that's going to change the, you know, society, 
to say we're not, we, we don't want to be in a crime uh, ridden area anymore. We need to make change. And I'm, I'm curious, what does, does it take, you know, bold, um, you know, a bold politician to, to make that kind of a statement and then get the support of the community? How does that happen? Because we, it's a real problem here. I remember doing some work in Iraq with Martin McGuinness, and we were talking to leaders of all the political parties there. And he said two things. The first thing he said was, you can continue fighting and killing each other for five years or 25 years, but let me tell you this, there is no physical fighting outcome that's going to resolve your problem. It's a political problem, and if you keep fighting, it's just going to mean more dead people and a prolonged problem. It's not going to resolve your problem. It's a political problem. The second thing that he said was, it's a question of leadership. <laughs> it's crucial that you have leaders who are prepared to take the risk to do the right thing for the betterment of the community rather than themselves. And you were referring there to Georgia Sorensen, and it's a great delight, Georgia, to see you here. Georgia uh, and, and I were together with you in Cambridge because she was opening the James McGregor Burns Center at Churchill College there, an academy of leadership. And Jim Burns had a lot of things to say about the different kinds of leaders. Those leaders who are transactional, who are just I want a bit of this, a bit of that, I'll give you this if you'll give me that. And then there were transformational leaders whose commitment was to make a difference in their community and for their community. And I guess if it's not there at the moment, then maybe as parents and even as grandparents, we need to take the responsibility for encouraging our children and grandchildren to be courageous to do the right things, not in an arrogant way that says, I know it all, or I'm better than somebody else, but in a way which is genuinely looking for the betterment of the community. I have to tell you that when I've been asked, as I have from time to time, why did I get involved in this? I always come back myself to thinking the same thing. It's because of the father and mother I had a father who was committed to following the things he believed in and challenging me and often arguing together, and a mother who was graciously concerned about the welfare of other people in the community. And I think that if we're going to make these changes, we have to shoulder the responsibility ourselves to try to make that kind of difference so that we become leaders and our children and our grandchildren become leaders who are transformational leaders, not just transactional leaders doing it for their own benefit. And so I, I just want to pay tribute to Georgia and the work she's done in trying to not just build those in America, but in the International Leadership Association doing it in countries all around the world. Thanks, Georgia. Thanks. I'm Carlos Farin. I'm a little bit of an outsider here. I'm from Costa Rica, a country that, you know, has been blessed with long-standing peace. And I think one of the reasons that we've been blessed with this peace was that Costa Rica, early on in its democracies, decided to deal with its structural inequities. Just yesterday, I came back from, Pan from Guatemala where for 30 years Guatemala suffered a, suffered a civil conflict, a lot based in ethnical disparities that existed between the indigenous population, which represents 40% of Guatemala, and the non-indigenous. They might have, in 1996, developed peace accords that stopped the physical violence, but it not, did not stop the structural violence. Could you address maybe the experience in, in Belfast or in Ireland in addressing this, and I think this relates a little bit to the situation that people live here in Baltimore. The act of physical violence is just a response of the structural violence that certain pockets of communities suffer 
that was a little bit of my comment and question to you. Thanks. It's, it's a very important and challenging question. Because what I find in looking at places all around the world where there has been violence, where people have actually turned to physical violence, it's very rarely simply because of socioeconomic inequity. The three things that I've found in every single place where people have turned to intractable violence has been that there's been a community of people who have felt humiliated and disrespected. A community or more than one community of people that felt they have been treated deeply unfairly. And thirdly, that they have not been able through democratic and peaceful means to change those things. Sometimes people are living in societies that are socioeconomically unequal, but they don't feel treated in a humiliating and disrespectful and unfair way. And they know that through democratic, peaceful means, they can actually make change. But if they are in circumstances where they feel that the inequity is disrespectful, unfair and not able to be changed peacefully, then you have the recipe for someone to turn people to violence as the only way of making a change. So I think it is important for us to explore these things and if I put it in this way, not to depend on a lot of the political theory of the past to resolve our problems. One of the reasons that I went into psychiatry was because I didn't believe that the political science of the 1960s, which is when I was a teenager, actually had a real answer to the problems that we had in Northern Ireland. And I think if we have approaches to politics which have not worked, then the answer is not to keep doing them, but to find a different way of doing politics that brings a better outcome. And that is something that is not easy. It's much easier to just do things in the past but double the dose. But as doctors, we know that if a medication isn't working, continuing to double the dose doesn't cure the patient, it poisons the patient. And I think it's true also in that wider issue of public health that we call politics. We have to find a new way of doing it that ensures that people get respect not humiliation, justice, not unfairness, and a peaceful, democratic way of making change. Thank you.